Welcome and thank you to this, our very first episode of a rather unique uh, podcast series that we're putting together as live from the Financial Planning Association Congress uh, recorded in Sydney. Yeah, it's uh, the 30th birthday it's this year, It's the 30th Fraser. birthday and we are celebrating. It's old but new. Absolutely. <laughs> And so we're going to be bringing you a whole lot of people from in and around the conference, from speakers uh, and guests and people who have got something to add to the community. Welcome, Danny. I'm here with Danny. Thanks, Fraser. Look, this is really exciting. Um, XY is all around sharing and learning and putting people together so that more ideas make advice great. And today's Congress that goes over two days is all about that as well. So it's great that we can take these ideas and make them available to people that couldn't actually attend the Congress. And Congress actually started before today, Fraser. So our first guest joining us at the very first fireside chat is Adam Crabb. So Adam, you got in early because there was some pre-events to the event. I am an early bird, Danny. I, you know, uh, love to sort of get in, get involved, get engaged uh, at an early stage. So kind of excited to be here at Congress. Awesome. So Adam, what do, who, who are you? Tell us who you are. Well, for those that don't know me, uh, insurance nerd, guru, uh, risk strategy specialist with Zurich. So anything and everything to do with life insurance is kind of my bag. I had a pr- the privilege of working with uh, the crab, as we called him, um, when I was at Zurich. So it's so great to have you here, Adam. You have attended a bit of a first for the FPA yesterday. So it's to do with the CFP program that the FPA is bringing to market. Can you tell us about what happened? You were a panellist at that particular day? Yeah, absolutely. It was a wonderful event, Danny. And uh, it was, as you say, it was an inaugural event for the FPA where they put together uh, a bit of a showcase and a celebration in a way of CFP professionals. Uh, So what we did is we sat down, put together quite an intensive case study, um, one in which, uh, you know, I was joined by some amazing, amazing colleagues, uh, Louise Bitti from the Aged Care Step, so Mm -hmm. some incredible Aged Care Insights. Uh, and a couple of practitioners, Catherine Creasy and Shane Summer, uh, Shane Summer, who really were uh, kind of leading the charge in terms of not just dissecting the case study, but really exploring what other CFP professionals do in their business. What was the case study on? What did you, oh what my did gosh. you study? Well, what didn't you study? What was what were the things that came out of the it case really study? It really had everything. Okay. Um, everything from family trust structures, a uh, bit of a complex family uh, situation. Uh, there were people with uh, no dependents, others that were single parents with dependents, a bit uh, cash strapped. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really was stretching that sort of uh, advice knowledge piece into considerations from everything from estate planning, enduring powers of attorney, guardianship, legal guardianship, through to you know wealth protection strategies. Uh, at yeah, one particular yeah. point, we sort of talked through a situation where someone in the late 50s suddenly had a stroke. You know, What would you do in that situation mm-hmm. now that you've got the complexity of aged care Elder abuse, NDIS, wow. so it really did have everything. I was yeah, just thinking, I was thinking the ca- capacity and all. There's lots of things to consider, isn't there? In yeah. that aspect. And and tell us about that that process that you went through. There was there obviously moments where people went, um, "Holy crap!" Mm. Look, it's a good question, Fraser. I think because one of the things we really wanted to do was give enough time to sort of explore some of these situations in more detail. So we really did sort of look at in different chunks in a way, and spent you know 40, 45 minutes really going through each of those. Uh, collaborating uh, and getting some really strong insights from the attendees just to sort of see how they do things. How everyone would change and yeah. flex with the same case. What and a fantastic initiative. Some amazing initiative. insights from some of these practitioners. Really willing to share, Danny, so yeah. it was lovely. Can, can you, and this, look, I know we've put Adam on the spot and he's first up this morning, but elder abuse is a really topical conversation within XY. What um, what does a planner do if they suspect elder abuse? Like, what what came out of that conversation on that front? Yeah, look, it's, it's certainly a delicate subject, yeah. uh, and I think getting some of the, those amazing insights from um, Louise in particular around that situation. I think there's probably no easy answer for that. It really depends on the situation. It depends on the what is actually happening to that individual at that particular point. But I think part of the messaging does reside in getting uh, better ingrained within that broader family unit as best as you can, uh, which also makes sense, I think, from an intergenerational advice perspective because often, you know, the people you're dealing with today could actually be the future client tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And has Louise experienced that ex- that situation? Had she sort of gone through a journey of, of that? No, no? No, I, she, I don't think she I'm should. so curious about it. Like, yeah. it's, it's this sort of conversation that it, it's really difficult to find some tangible how-to. Like, we're always here to extract the how do you do something, but it's one of those things that um, 
yeah, that people are on the lookout for that is obviously prevalent. There's an issue there. And um, topical, as you say, yeah. with the uh, Royal Commission into Disability Edge Care, etc. So it's certainly front of mind for, for a lot of people. So if anyone's listening and has some tips or mm. has experienced it, it'd be awesome if you could get in touch with us at XY and, and tell us and let us know because I think there's a bit of a conversation we could have around elder abuse. Yep. And, uh, and Adam, I'm curious about your part because we talked about Louise in, 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 in this. Mm. Uh, tell us about your part of the presentation and what you what highlight, what were you, what were you bringing to the conversation? Yeah, so we were looking at... Uh, sort of the uh, the middle cohort. So there was a, an older, uh, mature age uh, individual, um, Mona from memory was her name in her late 80s. Uh, but the focus and emphasis for me was on this kind of middle cohort, this sort of husband and wife that were considering some of the aged care implications for the elderly parent, but also some of the potential financial disruption of the adult children and the grandchildren. So my sort of emphasis was on that kind of cohort, really exploring what would you do in that situation? Um, there was some financial dependency issues with one of the adult kids and just talking through what does that look like? Um, you know, if you're purely just focusing on retirement planning, that cash flow analysis for that individual, if something happens to one of those adult kids, what would that mean? How would that disrupt that family unit, whatever retirement planning is they're putting into play? So bringing a few kind of ideations into that, that mix. And tell us a little bit about the ethical considerations, because obviously you you know you talk you're you're a tech nerd as well. Yeah, uh, you're you're an uh, insurance nerd. Tell us a little bit about some of the ethical implications that came out of the case study, and and, and what was the sort of findings around that, yeah. that grey area of uh, what might be ethical and not. And you've hit the nail on the head. It really is such a grey area. So uh, giving that open forum to really discuss what you would do, how as an advisor you would approach certain situations, because being grey, there's no right or wrong, right? Mm. It, it can be. Um, you know, fairness, uh, honesty in one one area, but it could also require a level of diligence and objectivity to remain sort of ethically minded moving forward. Um, a bit of a method yeah, rather than a certain Very method. much. Yep. So um, lots of communication, lots of questioning, uh, a lot of almost reflection on the situation. So, you know, part of I think what we sort of talked about was uh, not wanting to jump straight to solutions mode getting advisors thinking about what are some of the broader conversations and impacts that you could maybe consider before stepping forward and actually going through how do we attack this with a strategy or provide a solution. So, yeah, it was good. Good fun. Awesome. So the uh, the main highlights from the session for you? Uh, look, selfishly the insurance stuff, obviously, but to be honest, I think what I really enjoyed was hearing what some advisors are doing in their business and um, having feedback with some of the other attendees, um, just hearing them and saying, look, I've got some great ideas, great insights from some of our you know, colleagues, practitioners, being able to take them away and implement them in their business was certainly a standout for me. Yeah, I was going to ask about the planners in the room next about that conversation. What, from there going forward, what do you think they took away from that, that, that having that session? I think of very much the snippets on how they would attack um, certain situations because it was quite a complex one. But equally, some of the ways in which they're just simply engaging uh, yeah. from a, a, you know, a, a, an entry-level new client perspective, uh, the way in which they're differentiating themselves and um, uh, one of the advisors, forgive me, I can't remember her name, but just sort of talk through how uh, they would actually sort of photograph and catalogue different things that the retirees are doing and they have kind of the showcase in their Amazing. practice, which is wonderful. So it's kind of one of the first things that you see and it's almost a bit um, like an addiction. They want to be part of that. So what can they do in their retirement to be part of that sort of overall process? Yeah, really, really interesting, fascinating given, stuff. Given you're the insurance nerd, it would be remiss of us not to, uh, not to ask what your tips and what you wanted the audience to take out of that session. Like what were the nuggets of gold that you handed on yesterday? For mine, it was definitely wanting to embrace every element that you could possibly look at. Uh, while something like insurance is seen very much as a speciality, uh, not being in a situation where you want to necessarily not dismiss but really wanting to embrace any area and opportunity that could arise, even if it's not necessarily your kind of core business. So whether it's partnering with another you know, CFP professional or, or advice uh, provider to um, you know, attack any area of that client situation, which could be potentially vulnerable if left unaddressed. Absolutely. Fantastic. Adam, thank you so much for coming along and having a fireside chat with us at the at the Congress and our little uh, podcast bar that we've got set up here. In, yeah. in, in the Early most, morning too, early so morning thank day. you. Uh, thank very you good. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Thanks, Dan.
Hello and welcome back to another edition of our very special podcast brought to you from the Financial Planning Association Conference. Uh, I'm joined by Danny. Thank you for joining me, Danny. Hey, Fraser. And we have a special guest joining us for our second episode. Yes. Thanks. We actually weren't going to speak to Kat, so it's very nice that she's turned up. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're, you're a bit sprung because we heard some fantastic things about what you're doing in your practice, particularly with your engagement, and it's a very different. So... You're actually nominated by Marissa to have a chat with us. So we would love you to tell us a little bit about your business and sure. then we can dive into what you're doing that's a bit special. Thank you. Yes, well, I've been a planner for 35 years, but I've run my own business uh, in Brisbane. It's called Goals and Dreams Financial Planning. We've got a huge postcard board. Clients send postcards from all over the world. Um, and I'm just really passionate about making a difference in, in people's lives. So Postcards from all over the world. Yes. Yeah, tell us more about that. When I get overwhelmed with compliance, I go and stand at the postcard board and it helps ground me and refocus me. I help that person get to Paris and I help that person with whatever their goals and dreams are. And um, yeah, that's it. fantastic. And, and it's amazing human, to be on a mission to, to, for something, isn't it? Well, the human nature to the clients, when they send a postcard, they try and send an unusual one so it'll stand out on the postcard board. So, What's um, the weirdest one you've got on the postcard board? Uh, the weirdest one is um, a meat pie. Oh, I'm liking with, it already. Uh, um, a map of Australia in tomato sauce from one of my clients who said he didn't really have any anything on his wish list and then came the biggest traveller that I've ever had. So, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. And where's the, what, tell, tell us about where in the world are all these postcards from. Oh, everywhere. Everywhere. Um, all sorts of countries, you know, <laughs> yeah, just all over the world. In, in lockdown, one of my clients, so I'm Brisbane North, she lives at Bribey, which is about... I know hour. Bribey well. I used to yes. do holidays at Bribey in the early years. So my beautiful <laughs> co- she sent me a postcard from Bribey. She said, I knew you'd be missing postcards in, in COVID because no one's travelling. Mm. So, yeah. 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 Fantastic. And tell us a little bit about the book. You've written a book and uh, I want to know all about well, this. I'm actually in the process of writing an, an actual book called Attitude, Abundance and Action, but this one is more a a booklet. Um, I was in lockdown and I had some thought capacity. So I went, oh my God, I've got all these amazing clients who've been with me for 10, 15, 20 years and travelled the world, had an amazing retirement. But when they first came to me, they had all the fears and will I have enough money and what will retirement look like? Um, So I thought, why don't I ask a series of questions to all those clients Mm. And um, they all were very lovely and participated, sent amazing photos in and then um, we put it into this booklet and, uh, and now I give it to my new clients as they're coming through, you know. As what they can achieve. If, if, okay, fantastic to make absolutely. it real. I think this is an amazing opportunity. Like, is it, This is telling your, your new clients that you've got a whole lot of very happy existing clients. Yes. And, and we've got very much a community of, of my clients. Um, they mix with each other. We have a big Christmas party. We have winery tours. Yeah, do you go to... I've heard these winery I tours. Know, yeah. I know. It's, um, it's a really lovely feeling to know that you have made a difference to these people's lives. And um, we, we had a lovely thank you lunch for the people who participated and have a, had a goodie bag with the, the copy of the, the book and a bottle of champagne and so Fantastic. forth. Fantastic. There is another layer to this story which is quite heartfelt. Um, one of my clients had a battle with pancreatic cancer um, a couple of years ago, got through it, which is unusual. Um, And then it came back somewhere else, which often happens. And his wife rang me. We had their review due on the 16th of August. And about 10 days before that, she said, Kath, uh, you better come and say goodbye. Mm. So we go to say goodbye. But it was a very happy sort of celebration of life. Yeah. And um, his son was there with all the family members. And they said, oh, Kath, would you like to have a beer? And And his wife said, no, Kath will have a champagne. So, um, 10 minutes before I was about to leave, the, we got an email to say the books had arrived. I delivered the very first one oh. that he participated in. 
um, with photos of he and his wife on the Great Wall of China having a picnic where you're not supposed to have picnics and Siberian mm. Railway, all, all these amazing things. So that was quite amazing how that happened. Um, 16th of August came along and he was still with us, so I went and did the review. And because so many people were coming to say goodbye, um, he said to me, you have no idea how many people have seen this book. Would you autograph it for me? Mm. His funeral was last Friday, so he lasted another three months. So yep. Yeah, you made a really huge difference. Absolutely. Now, you're getting all... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're, all, we're all getting a bit teary. Yeah. And, and, and if well, you're driving in a car while you're watching this, I hope you are listening to this. I hope you're not getting well, teary. it just shows what a difference we make to people's lives. And if we can get out to the world, you know, it's not just numbers and it's... It's the meaning behind the money. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way of honouring somebody's achievement, isn't it, in their um, in their retirement, the achievement of doing the things, you know, making the sacrifices, getting saving the money they need to, uh, investing the money, and then being able to actually spend it and, and, um, and showcase that. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, from the very first meeting, I write a homework list for my clients and all the usual things during your budget and have you done your wills and during private training. But the most important thing is what's on your wish list in life. And then what do we have to do financially to help you achieve those things? Mm. So I think that's really important. I'm really interested in that because, I've, you know, it is very hard and it doesn't surprise me that you say some people don't have a wish list. Like, it's really hard to articulate and find those things that you shouldn't, you should say, like, everyone brings things to the table, I think, that they say that sound amazing. But how, how have you refined your process to get to what, really matters to someone over the years like has that evolved for you yes it's i get husbands and wives to write separate wish lists because often he'll what a great idea you know i didn't know if she wanted to go heli skiing off the slopes of new zealand and i didn't know he wanted to do this because i really encourage people to say what are the things that you've said one day i'd like to um you know stop putting it off you know we're we're all about you know, achieving your goals and dreams and enjoying the journey. And just quickly, I've, I've got some clients um, that started with me 15 years ago, came from Western Australia. On their wish, they put in retirement, go to New Zealand. So Brisbane to New Zealand is not very far, but Perth to New Zealand is. Mm. Um, so we set things up for them and in within 18 months, they sent me a postcard from New Zealand and put on it, thank you for giving us permission. Wow. Now, they just retired officially last year. They've been to Canada, been to Europe. They've travelled all over the world. So it's it's just reminding people to stop putting life off and, and keep enjoying because we all know death happens, divorce happens, ill health. You know, just, just this is what life's all about. So, you know, what do we have to do financially to help you achieve it? Have yeah. you always been into the goals and dreams? Comp- like that was that naturally yes. your tilt. So you've always yes. since you've been in advice for a few years. Yes. Has that always been what you've done, or has there been a transition point where you went from the the financial stuff to no. really honing no. in? You always there. Um, my first conference was myself and twenty eight men, um, and I'm tall, so I already stood out anyway. But I realised then the element that was different and it was not just about the numbers it's about about life and and making a difference yeah Yeah, the really the emotional tilt on the whole the value that uh that planners bring to to the clients yes yeah fantastic and thank you so much for coming and telling us about your story today now you were involved in a session yesterday as well Uh, tell us a little bit about that uh yes well it was the uh the inaugural cfp gathering and um they had a case study in all different aspects of it, but I think it was really we all did little workshops and hearing ideas from everyone around the table, and uh, yeah, that w- that was invaluable because everyone brings different elements. And, yeah, yep. So. Yeah. And what's it like uh, for you to be able to come to a, a conference in, in person? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's three years gap, isn't it, between I, the last one and I this know. one? Well, humans, we all need that human contact and be able to give somebody a hug. <laughs> it's just, you know. Or a bottle of champagne. Or a bottle of champagne. <laughs> Share a bottle of champagne. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It sounds, so, like a, sounds like a great theme. Thank you so yeah, much for coming and chatting with welcome. us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Kath. 
And we're off in the break at this. Uh, we're getting people between muffins we and are pies, dragging Fraser. People in left, right, and centre. A lot of the presenters from the Congress uh, are turning up to the podcast booth, yeah. and we are getting these gems, these fireside chats. Uh, Making sure we can spread all of the session gold broader than the people that could make it, or maybe you couldn't get to a session. So. This is the spot to Absolutely. get the highlight reel of the what's being spoken reel, exactly about. The highlight reel, exactly right. Welcome, Peter. Peter Thanks, Warren, Fraser. thank you for joining Thanks, us. Danny. Great to be uh, here. Tell us a little bit about. First, let's start with you to start. Well, tell us a little bit about you and your and your business and how you work with advice to yeah. advise them. And- so I'm uh, a joint managing director at Fenura. Um, I work with a pretty talented bunch of people. There's nine of us now in the company. Uh, we work predominantly with independent financial advisors, technology companies, and product manufacturers to a, a more recent times. Um, around better execution when it comes to advice technology projects. Um, fair to say this industry's got a lot of choice mm. uh, with tech, but usually where things go off the rails is on the people execution side of things more than the tech itself. So oh, that's, yeah. where, that's where we play a role. I also play in that space around <laughs> the con- the combination of humans versus uh, technology and yeah. how they all play together or don't play together predominantly. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your session that you're going to be involved with today. It's got a pretty, pretty, pretty yeah, fun... Yeah, well, the, the session is, is tech the saviour of advice? It's an ambitious uh, title. Um, I, it's just, in many respects, I think advice could be the saviour of tech in, in this space. Um, if we look at, you know, maybe where technology companies have potentially got it wrong historically is they haven't had enough of an understanding of advice. And one thing I'm really delighted to see at the FBA in the last couple of years, the last couple of conferences has been this growth of the technology companies participating actively in, in the tech space, that the tech alleys pretty popular now and I see that you know they're major players in our ecosystem so I, I don't think one you know is going to save the other I think that they need to work together to save yeah. each other yeah working together is the key there and <laughs> yeah. absolutely and uh, and so with the session today because we haven't had it yet we can't talk about the highlights real so much or we can what are, we can what are you going to make gold. the highlights <laughs> yeah. Yeah. tell us what's going to make the highlights real. oh look I think we've got a few diverse opinions I mean we'll hear from um, Corey Russell who's a you know obviously a well-known advisor he's going to be talking he's he's probably what I would call a tech explorer in our industry and someone that's definitely mm. open to trying new things I, I, I hope he probably pushes the room a little bit to not be tech laggards. I think advisors mm. do sometimes uh, risk averse when it comes to making technology decisions or things that are out of their comfort zone and just hope to you know, open up the conversation to for advisors to push themselves a bit further. Um, I think some of the other panellists are representing the technology companies, so I'll probably do my best a little bit to give them a prod to sort of mm. understand Get what, under the skin. what are they doing. I mean, they're the most well capitalised of all of us um, to support advice moving forward. And, and I I hope what I'd like to see is, you know, as this industry has shrunk to a large extent, we need to collaborate a lot more and compete less for the the providers, and particularly the tech companies as well. So that's probably something I'm going to chat about. Yeah, now you mentioned the word laggard. It's it's an interesting one because I think a lot of uh, advisors and planners see themselves as laggards. Uh, and, a, and a little bit scared to take, mm. the, take the plunge. And so there's a bit of a nervousness around the confidence and the competence around using technology. Yeah, I, I think, um, look, once bitten, twice shy, perhaps mm. is, is an expression there. Um, and, and the evidence is quite clear. I mean, m- most advisors have changed licensee a few times. Very few have changed technology from yeah. our experience. Um, so part of that, you know, is, uh, we think companies like our play, play a role to educate advisors, um, get comfortable with the change management. But I think the other challenge for advisors in future will be recruiting people into their practices who have these skill sets, who understand technology. And I think this is where power planners, um, client service managers, general managers play an enormous role in the industry moving forward. And hopefully take some of those technology decisions off the advisors so they can just focus on what they do best. Peter, there's a statement that um, I'm going to steal from Peter Diamatides, who's a bit of a tech nerd and she runs our tech podcast at um, XY, our advice tech podcast. Don't automate awful is something that she has once said that really resonated with me. What are your couple of tips to make sure that people don't automate awful or then embed awful because they don't have the change management process mapped out. Can sure. you give us the couple of things that you see that you go, ah, oh, you should have avoided that? Yeah, I, I think tech's a bit like your diet, crap in, crap out. Um, so I, I would say I'm, I'm staggered by the amount of businesses that we come across who have embarked on quite ambitious technology projects without actually cleaning up their backyard with data. Um, mm-hmm. Most businesses, probably at this conference, have done some sort of M&A at some point in their time and they're often really good at getting out to see the clients and 
getting the staff together, but not so good at actually cleaning up their databases, you know, filtering, you know, really getting that in a good working order. So I would say uh, if you're going to do anything, tidy up your data before you even think about any ambitious technology projects would be my first one. Fantastic. And that that involves a bit of a, um, you know, investment in in time and effort and money and and resources and the right humans to do the job. Um, Do you you find that it's a bit of a problem for advice firms that that just don't have the resources? Yeah, it's the biggest one. I mean, I think this is why you're seeing more, uh, potentially more collaboration between IFAs looking to merge together just because they just don't have those resources in-house that they need. Um, I know how busy advice businesses are, you know, just day to day doing the BAU. So just having the bandwidth for a change project is a real challenge. Um, but obviously, you know, it's sort of hope that in future if, as tech improves and maybe if we get um, some good results with the regulatory environment that some of that pressure will come off and it'll hopefully free things up so advisors can, can serve more clients and recruit some people into their business that can actually drive some of this change. Because, yeah. uh, look, the tech, um, one thing I would say is that no, no software in history is ever, uh, at least in our space, we don't have really AI-driven systems in our space. The software doesn't think for itself. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's the humans that don't. Um, so I would argue that it's the people side of it that needs the biggest amount of change. And, you know, this phrase of if you work in cyber, you know, it's most cyber incidents are caused because of human human issues rather than software issues. So um, I, I think it's something that needs to be on the very much on the um, roadmap for advice firms to have a deliberate tech strategy and mm. appoint key people in their business that own that for them. There's a bit of a tech race on, like it's, it's heating up in mm. terms of the solutions, the providers... What would your advice be to them? You spend a fair bit of time you've, within advice businesses. What what are the things that they really need to focus on to be one of the top choices the for advisors? Providers. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I think we're seeing a bit of a byproduct of uh, the broader economy where we had this rush of capital into technology ventures in the last ten years, really, and that's sort of quietened down a little bit. So that's probably why we're seeing so much tech emerging. Um, I, I, I think the tech providers. My encouragement would be to try to own your space, be the very best at what you do and resist the urge to creep too far beyond that. I know it's tempting, but um, there are just certain categories that require a certain skill set. I'll use Client Portal as a great example um, and fact-finding where that is, a, that is a human design process to build software because it touches the end customer, the end client of an advisor where if you're building back office operation software, that's a really different set of skills. So I would say pick your mark. You're either front office dealing between the advisor and the client relationship or you're in the back office as a software developer and try not to cross hairs yeah. too much. Uh, now, I always think about when, I, when you, you know, using technology, it's great to have a tool. How often would people use the tool to its extent? As in, as in often, you know, things do so many things and all of a sudden you're using 20, 30% of the actual end in you know what what could be used yeah i I think i mean you're sort of evident your question i think the reality is most people don't um we're constantly amazed even by the the lack of um usage of things that become native in microsoft 365 for example people using other solutions that microsoft already does for them out of the box um a lot of work we do um ironically people think we we add tech to practices quite often we strip stuff out Mm. to simplify um so i think exploring the depths of the capability you've already got should always be your starting point before you look to change anything um and i think there's been a bit of a uh maybe certain businesses we see a temptation to throw tech at the problem rather than looking at what the real problem is um and that maybe that's why we're seeing those things you new things go in which yeah really looking, for, be looking for the quick fix rather than 100%. actually yeah getting getting in and, uh, and researching yep uh, now no conversation with technology would be complete if we didn't talk about the future where do you where do you see all this heading for for advice professionals uh look i, I look to other markets we, we do a lot of work in the uk and the us i, I would expect to see a um, we're, we're, our market's going through a transition from a very much a, a bank-led, um, institutional-led advice industry to an IFA industry, and that's awesome as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've been in the industry 20 years. I started as an advisor, and I was always um, staggered by the lack of IFA. so I'm just so encouraged to see what's happening. Um, I, I do believe that you know we, we will see a proliferation of new solutions more tailored for the IFA market that we don't have today. And what I'm really hoping to see is better collaboration between platform providers and technology companies and the other software vendors to actually work collaboratively and integrate really well together and maybe resist the urge to put up the the, the, the data moats, let's call them, um, to protect their own patch. I, I think if the sector grows more vibrantly, I think 
IFAs will have all the power in the future um, and hopefully that voice will drive that integration discussion as it does in other markets like the US. Yep. Well, you've got a session to get to soon, Peter. Abs- you've got a <laughs> absolutely. <I feel laughs> we like, snuck you in before like your we, actual big session. I feel session. like we stole all the gold before the session, which is amazing. No problem, Peter. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today. Really appreciate it. It's been Great wonderful, to, Peter. Great to thank meet you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for joining us again. We are coming to you from the Financial Planning Association Conference in Sydney. Uh, I'm joined by Danny. Thank you for joining me, Danny. Hey, Fraser. We're here again. Wonderful to have you. With a lovely new guest. Co-hosting. Beautiful new guest that's going to talk about their session today. Welcome. Thank you, Kat. Thank you very much for having me. Now, Kat has said it's either Catherine or Kat, so that's... You've got to stick to those names, I'll, I'll Rosa. That up for yeah, sure. great. <laughs> I'll muck that up. So you've got a really interesting session, and we'll get to that uh, shortly, Catherine. We'd love to first just know about your journey, how you became an advisor, what your business looks like. I did some um, stalking, I'm going to call it earlier, oh. around, and you have a lot of um, yeah. You've got some great credentials, especially in women in advice. It would be great to hear what your journey has been very quickly, and then how you got to speak at the FPA and what that session is about. Sure. Um, So I did a degree in marketing and worked in marketing for three years and really loved it until I didn't. And then because when I graduated, which was, gosh, what, 2002, it was really hard to get a job in marketing. When I decided I didn't love it anymore, I thought, how am I going to get another job? And a family friend worked in stockbroking and he had been badgering me to come and work with him for ages and so I thought oh you know what I'm going to give it a crack and so 2003 I started in stockbroking I loved it so much fun Mm. so much fun for the brokers not so much fun for the clients so I was there through the GFC saw a lot of wealth destruction and sort of decided this is not my career I I really enjoy the finance side of things but I don't think I can be a stockbroker And then um, started looking around, a friend um, introduced me to Capital Partners and so I thought financial planning, massively dirty word in stockbroking, but let's give it a crack Mm. and for the first three months I hated it and then I loved it. And I've been very happy for eight years ever since. Fantastic. And your session today is ethically releasing a client. That's a really interesting conversation and, and it's about... When do you know that the relationship probably needs to come to an end? And if you could give us some insight into you know, how you got, um, yeah, how you got involved in such a topic, has has this been an experience that's come up for you in your business? And uh, it has, it definitely has, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those examples. It's certainly not something that happens really often, but you know, we go through a lot with our clients, and it's really important to have a really good and engaged relationship with them and sometimes things just come up that mean that you can't uh, you can't efficiently and actively service them anymore and we've sort of narrowed that down to three little categories which is your chaotic client who just you know doesn't get back to you they um, don't uh, they don't respond when you need things they say they're going to come to a meeting and they don't show up and you just get to a point where you know you can't efficiently service them anymore. There's also um, people who just don't take your advice. And I've had that experience with a client who I loved, but really he was just going rogue. And you get to a point where you think they're doing things that are destructive for their wealth and can you actively be their advisor anymore? And then the last sort of client that we'll talk about is when it, it comes a point where they don't really have enough going on to justify your fee anymore. And so how do you actually make sure that you have the right conversation with them and that you leave them in a good position? You don't just say, sorry, we're not taking your money anymore, see you later. Yeah. And, and what would be your, your, can you kind of, that's a pretty uh, multifaceted probably approach, but what, what would you say are the things that you've embedded into that process of releasing that client in an ethical way? So I guess it depends on, on sort of who it is, but there is so much stuff that you can do to make sure that they're left in a good position. And it might be, you know, if they're going to another advisor, it might be the really seamless handover of any advice documents or anything that the other advisor requires. But it's also, if they're going to go it alone, then make sure they've got the right support around them. So, for example, um, then running a self-managed super fund, make sure they don't just have an, a, well, try and set them up with an accountant who's not just going to do the compliance work and not help them with some of the more strategic stuff. So, make sure that they're with 
other advisors who can really engage with what they need. Um, and, and then for a client that you think is probably no longer going to be advised anymore, is do you need to write them one last statement of advice, which is kind of almost the, the set and forget type of plan? So w- what are the things that you need to do to just make sure that that relationship ends really well? Yeah, I, I want to ask this question because it's my assumption is that a lot of uh, clients would go, oh, look, I'm really sorry I was... When you have that, when you breach that conversation, you say, "Look, you're just a bit too chaotic for us, or you're not following our advice, and so we we need more structure out of you." That they go, "Oh no, no, please give me a second chance." Is that ha- is that happening? Yeah, for sure, stuff like that does happen, um, and I think it's about really honest conversations and holding each other both to account. So um, we've certainly had the scenario whereby someone is a bit chaotic, and when you sit down and have the discussion with them it's because the relationship's not working for them or it's not quite what they wanted or maybe thought it would be. And then it's just a a meeting of minds and you both agree that this is not the way forward. Um, But there has been times, yes, when you sort of have to have an honest conversation with a client and say, you're not getting back to me, we're meaning to do this, that and the other. And if, um, if you sort of, and I wouldn't use these words, but if you can't come to the party, then do you really, do you really want to be paying me? And, and sometimes, you know, they're going to pull up their socks and go, you know what, I am paying you a lot of money and I do want to have a good relationship and so I'm going to make it a priority to get back to you. Yeah, and I'm also thinking that there might be a fear out there amongst advisors going, they don't want the bad review or the, the rejection. They're like somebody feels like they're being rejected so that they lash out at the, the advice and the firm and the brand. Oh, absolutely. And that's why it's so important to leave every interaction with like a, a positive um a taste in your mouth is not the right thing but you know for it to be a positive ending of the relationship because just because things didn't work out with you and that person it doesn't mean that you can't help their friend or someone else and we do get referrals and you know not to um not to uh, you know more often than you would think from people who have been clients in the past and they're not anymore because they don't need us for whatever reason, but they say, you know what, if you need someone, these are the people that you need to speak to. So it's so important. You just don't know what's around the corner. You don't know. You just want to make sure always that you're um, leaving a positive influence on people's lives. Catherine, yeah. there's a really um, question that always comes up in XY and it taps into what you're speaking about here is around when a partnership is no longer a partnership and there's a divorce that occurs... That's quite a critical relationship point. Yeah. What do you do in, in that scenario? Like which partner do you decide to, to manage and how do you let the partner that you have, you know, opted out of, how do you, mm. how do you, how do you kind of extract yourself from that relationship? Because we get asked that question all, all the, the time. time yeah. yeah. So that, that is absolutely something we've talked so much about, particularly with the introduction of the Code of Ethics. Um, so actually, I work a lot with divorced women. That's sort of the specialty area that I have. But mostly they come to us when the relationship's already broken down. Thankfully, we haven't had too many clients divorce. Um, but what we've come to in our business is often at the start, because they've been having um, conversations about money, it does start off very amicably. And so when someone comes to us, if they come to us together and say we're splitting up, then we can be quite clear that we can continue to do like to manage the assets that we're managing, for example, as long as you both agree to everything and we will not have a conversation without another the other in the room. So you always have to come to meetings together. All communication is going to be CC'd to both of you. And we've got a list of almost terms and conditions if they want us to continue with both of them because often that's what they okay, ask for. And if they're happy to sign off on that, then we will continue. And generally speaking, it's not any strategic stuff. It's more just managing the status quo until they've made a decision. But we're also very clear, if you if you don't want that, that's absolutely fine. Let us know and we can find one or both of you another advisor. And we sort of put the ball in their court to make that decision. And so far, it's been... It's not been a difficult one. People have come to us and sort of been clear about it's going to be this person that retains you. Um, I Look, I don't imagine that's always the case. So we just try to be as honest and open with the couple as possible to be really clear about what we can do and what we can't do. And then if that's what they're happy to sign up for, it's also very clear as soon as they're not happy to sign up for that, let us know because then we will make a move. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad to hear that you've got these processes in place to be able to, to, to... 
to open yourself up to these conversations. Um, I think it's going to happen a lot more and more in, in yeah. the future and as, as advisors realise what their obligations are a little more and more and, and, and even when there's an uplift in you know, fees that aren't appropriate for that client, I think that conversation is going to be uh, prevalent within advice firms. Yes, absolutely. I have another question actually as a follow-on to that question. Given you said divorced women are your specialty, what is the things that you do amongst all the... I guess, moving parts that you've got to help put into a little bit more of a, a structured process map for someone going through a divorce. What are the things that um, you think your clients find hyper valuable and yeah. what are the things that you, uh, you know, your journey into this specialty and now you're going, you know what, out of all these things you could do for a person in that particular situation, what adds the most value or what's most treasured at that yeah. point? So I tend to find that I will get referred women who have not been the financial decision maker. So it's them taking the reins for the first time. We sort of call it from crisis to confidence. And so what where we add value is you would be so surprised about the people who might have really large chunky sums of money in the bank who will call me and say, I don't know if I can afford to get someone to clean the pool and I don't know how to do it myself. So what we give them is somewhat the permission but perhaps the information that they can spend money and still be okay Mm -hmm. and the things that they need to do to make sure that that money will last them throughout you know the rest of their life which might be 40 or 50 years whenever when women first come into me I often find they don't know about the moving parts they don't understand that there's a family trust they don't want superannuation because they can't access it and what I always say to them is However you're feeling now, I can almost guarantee in three years you're going to understand this, you're going to be confident and you're going to be coming in and telling me what you want. And it always happens. It's just the confidence, like the best part for me is seeing that confidence grow. Well, I think that's a really amazing takeaway to set that uh, ambition up in their minds is something that they will achieve and then they just head towards that. I really love that idea. Give them some direction. Yeah, it's the best. Honestly, it's the – like. That's why we do what we do, right? It's the best. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and chatting with us, Fireside Chat, today. We know you've got a busy schedule today, so really appreciate your time. Thanks, You're Catherine. welcome. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, we are coming to you from the Financial Planning Congress in Sydney, and we have got another special guest lined up for a, a little while to get here. Absolutely, for a fireside okay. chat. Uh, welcome. Welcome very much for the podcast. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Charmaine. We would love to start by knowing who you are, how your business is, and what you're actually going to be talking about at the Congress. Sure. Uh, so, Capital Partners, Private World, so from Perth, so we have travelled a little way and there is such a thing as Perth jet lag, I can promise. Um, so, we're a practice of around 40 staff members there, we're an independent practice and we've been running for about 20 years now, so very long-standing uh, practice. I've been there for about 10 years and my role is the Chief Operating Officer, so really about strategy, integration of strategy and making sure the team have everything they need to deliver really amazing work for our clients. Wow, and that hasn't been an easy job over the last uh, last couple of years for Chief Operating Officers with managing lots of humans in, in locations. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> lots of challenges. Now, uh, we are here to talk today about what some of the stuff that you were talking about at the Congress and when we talk about challenges, uh, that's certainly been uh, the theme. Mm. Tell, tell us a little bit about what you're talking about. Sure. So, um, a big session on cybersecurity. So, back in 2018, we were the unfortunate victims of a fraudulent event, and it was probably the best, worst thing that could ever happen to us. Um, but we learned a lot from it, and today I'm really here to share some of those learnings um, and help other practices make sure they can avoid some of the pitfalls that we fell into at yep. that point in time. Fantastic. Now, I do know a little bit about the session because I have been privy to it. Uh, it essentially, your story is broken up into three parts of sort of before mm. the attack happened, and then uh, obviously during the attack uh, that, that took place and then what you've done afterwards. So let's, let's probably start with that first part. Tell us a little bit about the practice I was tracking along before, uh, before the breach. Mm. So uh, we're, I would think, a very organised practice and uh, technology was very top of mind for us. What we weren't thinking about was specifically cyber security. So at that point in time, we'd done a recent upgrade of all of our technology and we were moving to a cloud infrastructure. So we had on-premise and we were moving to cloud. And as part of that, we moved a lot of our software into the cloud. What we weren't thinking about at the time was the risks that come with moving to a cloud migration and what that actually does to your business. Uh, We were so focused on the technology and moving there and upgrading 
that we weren't thinking about the back end. Yeah, now I describe this as, you know, we've all had that shiny syndrome scenario, but uh, I, I describe this a little bit around the concept of technology. We focus on working really well and easily and simply and all those sort of things, whereas in, when you talk about your cybersecurity, how, you, you're going, how do we stop things working so easily? Yes, and, and also how do you be operationally efficient and secure? Because you can be incredibly secure, but you also can't operate a business. So where's the balance in between there? How do you find that? And now, uh, so, so beforehand, you were, you know, great business, tracking along, technology, lo- love the use of technology. Uh, tell us about that moment then. It really came out of the blue. Um, it was a team member came up to me one day and said, oh, I think something's not quite right here. I received an email from a client requesting some funds to be transferred, and that's not the email that I actually received from them. There's a discrepancy in the amounts. And all of a sudden, that was a red flag. Yep. Um, so we had our IT investigate that and found out we'd had a breach and it had happened five days prior and hadn't been picked up. We didn't have any monitoring at the time and it wasn't noticed. Yep. Um, tell, so really scary, frightening time. Yeah, no, uh, t- <laughs> tell, me, now? <laughs> tell me about your emotional state at the time. Uh, I think it was shock. Um, when I look back, I realise how complacent we were and at that time it was just shock and what do you do now? Like where do you even start? So the obvious things, you know, quickly change your password. Okay, but, but then what? How do you start sifting through the mountains and mountains of information that passes in and out of your business every day to determine what's been accessed? Yep. Um, now, this was an email breach. So, it was a breach mm. within the email system, not, not, not within other systems that you're operating? We didn't know that at the time, but that's what it turned out to be. So, it was a breach on our office environment, but they only accessed Outlook, which was very lucky because they did have access to other parts of our environment, such as SharePoint, Teams, other areas like that. Yep. Interesting. Yep. And now coming out of that experience, what does best practice look like? Because you would have learnt firsthand around what you may have been able to embed up front to kind mm. of stop that shock of, oh gosh, we've got a breach. Yeah. A lot of it for us has really come down to training and awareness with the team. With all the systems and structure you can put in place to you know, stop or slow down cybersecurity breaches, at the end of the day, your biggest risk is actually your team members accidentally clicking on something that they're not aware is illegitimate. And so we do a lot of training and awareness, and it starts with uh, personal. So if they're personally aware of their own cybersecurity risks, then that naturally transitions over to their professional life. So we really focus on how do you keep your personal information safe, and then what do you do when you come to the office? Yeah, now that training is interesting because you uh, had the break some time ago. Everybody's aware of that and they understand mm-hmm. the ramifications and what goes on. Um, but changing culture takes time, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, and so, how have you found that over the last? You know, your staff coming up to a level. It's it's kind of like, not like a you know we've we've got to cram in and do a whole lot of exams. It, it's about ongoing. Absolutely, it's ongoing. So when a team member starts with us, the first session they do on their first day walking through the door is three hours on our security, cyber, technology, access, all those sorts of things. But for the rest of the team, it's about having an ongoing conversation. So we work with some cybersecurity experts and they help us give monthly commentary. You know, what is happening on the network? How many incidences are coming through? How many people are trying to get through our firewalls? Um, You know, we have little prizes and things when someone picks up a fraudulent email that slipped through our system. We kind of make it fun. We keep it part of the conversation. Yeah, I think that's that's the way to do it. Don't make it uh, too scary to talk about. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. How would you suggest, I mean, having a really robust process, I can imagine, would involve having a, a place where people can go, look, I might have done this thing that was outside of protocols and yeah. it's resulted. Like, how do you create that environment so people yeah. are open about things that they think may have gone wrong or you know, something that they feel is not quite right, mm. despite all this. Because if you're doing all this training, there's probably a, oh, I should get this right because I've been trained and there's an expectation. Yes. But I guess if, if it's too stringent on that, there's probably not the space for people to say, I've got a concern here or I kind of slipped up here or I didn't do that particular thing. How do you manage sure. that as a CEO? Uh, it's definitely part of our culture where it's okay to get things wrong, make mistakes and fail. Um, and I think that's where it starts as a, as a broad overview of what's okay in our business. And security is part of that. We're not perfect. We are going to make errors. We are going to make mistakes. The best thing we can do is put our hand up, own it, and then we fix it. And that's what we focus on first, fixing it. Uh, when this particular event happened, it was devastating for the team members that were involved. They were just so upset and... And just really concerned about our clients, the business, and it was their fault. And so managing our response to that, and yes, we're worried, but also not overreacting. It's not the team member's fault. They're also a victim of this. They didn't do it intentionally. 
yeah, they often feel silly at the time and, and, and at quite a vulnerable yeah. state. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about budget because a lot of small firms think, oh, is this an extra budget now we have to spend? Uh, how's your attitude changed towards the spending around and, and, and budgeting for cyber in your business? Uh, it's definitely it's a subset of our broader technology budget um, now. So probably uh, back then we were maybe spending 3% of revenue. Now we're spending about 4% of revenue and that includes anything cyber related. And we will be doing specific cyber projects which we fund, which are only chosen because of the security uplift that we need. So they're not technology based. It's not to do with our CRM or improvements or efficiency. It's literally security, security yeah. training, technology uplifts. Yep. So, so three percent was technology. It's now four percent. That includes cyber. Yeah. yeah okay. Four to so, four and a half now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. About Scarily 1%. enough. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And uh, well, so I think the big takeaway for me in your presentation is really around the, the planning that you've done mm. up front, um, and and then the, the ongoing planning that you've done since. Um, to have a response plan. Mm, absolutely. And I think it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when. So it is doing as much as you possibly can, what you can control, but then it's likely to happen. Yep. The amount of incidents happening now, it is going to happen to you. So what is your response going to be? What are your What is your initial plan that you have in place? And then how can you slow that breach down so that you can mitigate it as quickly as possible? Yep. Now, afterwards, you obviously there were some reporting obligations. Do you want to mm. talk us through what you did there and, and what was required? Mm. So um, we initially spoke to our compliance officer within on the first day that it happened and he advised us that we were likely at a breach privacy breach level because of the extent of the information in that mailbox so it was about lodging a notification with the um, office the Australian office of privacy commissioner yes yeah yep. oh I see and that was quite a lengthy process um, you have a certain amount of, you have a time frame in which you need to do that in and in that 30 days you often don't have all the information you really need to know the extent of the breach the data that you're sifting through is so unstructured, it actually takes time. And we've seen that with some of the recent breaches. It's about, we, we know something's been taken, but we, we're not sure what. Yeah, and I can completely understand sort of AHM and Medibank and, and why they're taking so long. It's very difficult to work out. Not only what has been uh, accessed, but what they've actually done with it. Because you can view some information, have they actually taken it and sold it? And there can be two buckets of data that you're looking at in there. Yep. Uh, Super complex. So you had five days. Was it five days in between something happening and you guys realising that there had been a breach five days? Because I heard a stat in, Fraser, you're the expert in, in this field, but that there's generally like 180 days between when something happens yeah. and when someone finds out that there's been a security breach. So it sounds yeah. like you were pretty fortunate in, time, in terms of the time or the window that yeah. this sort of breach was occurring and, and you were unaware. Absolutely, and it was luck. It actually came down to our verification procedures. So whenever we are transacting money, we do a, a soft verification uh, and that phone call with a client is what, what started the ball rolling. If that hadn't have happened, if we hadn't had that verification in process, it could have been a lot longer and a lot worse. Very yeah. fortunate. Yep. Yeah. That, that we talk about multi-factor authentication on software. That, that multi-factor authentication with clients is, is important too, it's getting, that, getting that, um, that phone call in. Um, talk to me about the reporting to your clients because this is a, this is a mm. scary, scary thing for advice firms to have to, to ring their clients. And, and I've seen stats where 93% of the client base expects that the, they will receive a call that day. Mm. It was one of the, the things at the top of our mind. What do we do with our clients? They were really concerned about the information that they may have lost. We're not even sure. And we want to talk to them, but we also don't have a lot to tell them. So for us, we actually spent two to three days trying to work out what data do we at least know that we can you know, share with them, but also not panic them and have them overreact when there's so much unknown. So our first email went out within that first week, and it was very generic in the sense that this has happened. We've had a breach. Um, it now has been mitigated. We've engaged some experts to help us do a full investigation around what has actually been lost and audited, and we will be in touch with you to let you know. And we also uh, gave out our CEO's phone number, direct. If you have any concerns, you call us straight away, but we want you to be vigilant. In the interim, we'll be calling you for any sort of verification, any transaction, and if you receive anything from us that doesn't look legitimate, please let us know and please call us. What yep. was the client's response to the, your... like? You're probably quite nervous around those phone calls, and I can only imagine your team so making those those um, phone calls. And, mm. and how were the clients reacting once you informed them that there had been a data breach? Well, our clients, they're amazing clients. They were actually wonderful. They were very understanding. They were also very thankful that we told them as early as we possibly could, even though we didn't have all the information. Um, and they were also, interestingly enough, they were very concerned about us and our team member who'd gone through that experience. 
and how awful that must feel for them. So that was a real surprise for us because that's not what we were expecting the response to be. It's a testament um, to the relationship that you have with them. Do you think there would be any different response today based on the, the recent fear, fear that's been put through the media? Absolutely. I think there'd be a much different response. In 2018, it was relatively you know, new that a breach would happen. It was very unusual, whereas now you're hearing about it every second day. And I think clients rightly expect us to have really thought about what systems we have in place to protect it. And if we don't, then we really have to be answering for it. So I do think there'd be a different response today. Yeah. Now, I, I want to focus a little bit on the, before we finish up about the, the future um, and around being proactive in this space with your clients and letting them know what security you do have in place. Mm, absolutely. So we communicate with our clients a lot and we also run education sessions for them. So security on their side is just as important because if they're hacked and they are sending us fraudulent emails, then that's also an issue. So continuing that conversation with our clients through training, through education, if something uh, doesn't seem right for a client, we'll get our IT company to go in and have a look at their laptop and make sure it's clean and it's okay. How do the clients receive that training? Do they do it? Yeah. Yeah, they do it. Yeah. Okay. And They're how do you really deliver engaged. that? Is it via video? Like how, what format do you deliver that training to your clients? We've done a couple via webinar more recently because we can't meet in person. But prior to that, we were doing face-to-face and we'd have 100, 150 clients in a room and we would just talk Incredible. to them. You know, what information are you putting out there? on the internet that people can use to then come back and and fortunately take your identity or or hack your database. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful opportunity, um, you know, adding to the the service that you provide, your your clients a bit on to demonstrate that you're providing those extra services. I think it's a great uh, great opportunity for practices. Charmaine, thank you so much for coming in and chatting us fireside chat about uh, your story. Really appreciate it. Welcome, Charmaine. Thank you. Welcome back to the XY and FPA Congress podcast. We've been having... 10-minute fireside chats, but this chat is a little bit different. It's a side fireside chat. So, Fraser, you're the person I'm speaking to because you're actually speaking at this particular Congress rather than just running the podcast. You've got a few things that you're uh, up to during I am, I am the next a little couple bit of busy days. Over the next couple of days, we're, we're doing obviously a lot of fireside chats. But yes, in this particular episode, I'll be in the hot seat. Um, the yes, we're running a session. Yeah, uh, and what's that session on? Because it's we all know that you do a lot of good work in cyber security. It's not my area of expertise. And the reason that a lot of people are gravitating towards the information and services you're offering in this space is because it's a bit of an unknown for a lot of advisors. So can you take those people who are a bit like myself, don't know a lot about this? Um, we, we obviously hear a lot about data breaches. We were just talking to Charmaine from Capital Partners. Now, they had a breach back in 2018. And she'll be sharing on the same panel that you're on you know, what they learned, what they're doing, how they're preventing future attacks. Because as she said, it's not a matter of um, if, it's just a matter of when. So can you start at the 101 and tell us what you're working through with advisors now and what's the level of understanding around cyber security? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a confusing and confronting topic. You know, you've got to lead into the fact that nobody likes to, con- you know, think about it for a, for a start with. Uh, it is confusing. There is a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of cyber talk. There's a lot of technology stuff in the background that people don't really know. And so no one looks to, no one wants to feel or look silly when they come to these conversations. And it's changing so often. Like just once you think you're across what you need to know. Yeah. It changes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and there is no silver bullet. You know, it's not just like, oh, I've got, I've got a, a really strong antivirus on myself. I'm, you know, th- I'm done. It's not about that. It's about saying, you know, there's about 12 or 13 different pieces to the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, Wherever you are in the in your current position needs to come up to a certain level. What does that level look like? Obviously, licensees have a lot of standards in place and those sorts of things, but there are certain um, cyber audit levels that are appropriate for financial professionals. And and in each one of those areas, um, my role really is to take that complexity and make it really, really simple to understand why you should care about that little thing and how do you fix it. So where are most practices now with cybersecurity? Like where where is the baseline? I think I think right now that the it's not it's not so much around the you know this is a thing you need to pay attention. I think it's pretty clear within the media that clients care about their their data and and, and you know and and as the primary person who's asking that, yeah. yeah the custodian of that data that you know the privacy principles you're responsible for the data that you collect. Um, as the business, you know, and, and it's, 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 there's a responsibility of the business, there's a responsibility of the licensee, there's a, there's a responsibility of all the staff to protect that client data. And, um, and you know, the expectation is from clients. And we've got clients at one end of the spectrum, you know, that, that who, who may walk 
if uh, if the data is breached, and at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the regulator and, and, and licensing and all the, all of those things in between. So there's lots of reasons why. So I'm I'm not really sure that there, we need to harp on the reasons why. Mm. I think people know the reasons why. So what do you do about it? There, where where are firms at at the moment? What do they actually do about it? Because that's where you can come in and help. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the big thing is understanding that the technology is part of the puzzle, and the humans are the other part. And the the humans in the office are often the ones that. Uh, inadvertently let things let people in and I describe the the business uh, the humans in the business as great hospitable humans that are trained to be very very nice to their clients and open the door and they're the ones that are usually opening the doors to the, to those sorts of things so a lot of what I do is um, describing in physical terms what the world what's actually happening in your software packages so in software there's a lot of assumptions we make oh it's it's in the cloud it's backed up no, it's not backed up. Um, I talk about the fact that, you know, if somebody's got their cloud storage, for example, they should be keeping another copy of their cloud storage because, you know, if they've got their Microsoft 365 and they're assuming that Microsoft is backing their, their, their data up, they're not. Mm-hmm. What they're doing is they're providing you a tenancy in an office building. Uh, you've got an office. They provide you with the lifts and the, and the bathrooms and the, and the fire sprinklers and all the things that they need to pro- provide as a tenant. But if you let somebody into your office that starts a fire, and burns out your office, you've lost everything in your office. You need to keep a copy of that. So just describing the way things work in logical terms, I think is really important. Um, we have conversations around how you share your client's data. and uh, What's refer- best practice in that? I ref- well, I refer to data as diamonds. So I start with the fact that if you had a diamond and the lifetime value of a client is generally more than a diamond. So if a client's giving you a diamond, are you going to ask them to put it in the post or are you going to provide a secure transfer? And so, if, if you've got a secure transfer service, aka, you know, a um, you know, a yeah, give us the share, AKA, give share, it. <laughs> SharePoint or anything okay, like great. that. Uh, many of the uh, the advisor portals that are used and the technology services that are around, uh, they're all secure s- services where you can where you can securely share data, same as you know, sharing that diamond. You don't put it in the post. But too many times, if we look at an email, there are just too many examples of important diamonds going into clients diamonds sitting in the mailbox and with the mailbox you know what we tend to do in the real life is we clear the mailbox and we take the letters inside and throw the junk mail in the wheelie bin but what happens in the the online world is we leave a copy of that email after we've opened it we leave a copy of those diamonds in our letterbox and too many times the mailbox as we just heard can be breached fairly easily and once the mailbox is breached, you can go and find all sorts. I remember a picture if I looked in your email or oh, anybody's, don't look at me that way, uh, Fraser, any advisor's <laughs> email and we search for statement yeah. of advice or a copy of his yeah. ID or anything like that, we would find them in the letterbox. They may have been open, but they're still stashed. And what we really need to do is talk about the fact that we take them out of the mailbox and we put them in the vault and that's where we keep them. We keep them in the vault and we should also be talking to our clients about taking their that same diamonds out of their mailbox and putting them back and keeping them in their vault and not keeping them in the mailbox at the front of the house. Mm. Yeah, it's a um, it's yeah, it's a it's a big it's it's a big question to ask and also understand. I guess my question that I had before was are the systems like Slack any better or are they all the same? Like uh, is Slack any better than email? Yeah, look the look the, the, the actual products themselves are quite secure. Mm. Uh, in in if they're being used properly and not, and you know, they've got multi-factor authentication and those sorts of things are activated so that you're not easily getting that information in. We are talking about um, clients' data, clients' diamonds, right? So we've got to make sure that we secure that as the most important precious stone, uh, and we've got to make sure that they're they're not in those those networks where they're being, you know. Uh, transferred over the internet and we're not being secure so one they've got to be on shore um and two you know they've got to be you know locked away multi behind multi-factor so locking stuff away you got you got structured data um and unstructured data and understanding how those two things work you've got me- email systems and locking down the back back end of email systems because email systems are, are, are one of those things that are set up to work really well which means you open the floodgates and you they work really well but if you if you're trying to stop all the cyber things coming in, you actually have to close all those floodgates and make them small trickles. 
um, turn your your uh, your letterbox into a, a registered post box. Um, you got the secure transfer we talked about, but then you got all the the security on you, your devices, device security, making sure that you got a really good quality one. Because within every brand there is a there is a crap version, and with every brand there is a really good version. Um, and you can move to the more expensive version. Things like pass- password managers being used and set up properly. Things like um, you know making sure that your your routers and your the way that you connect to the internet. Uh, I was going to say this morning uh, I was going to connect to the Wi-Fi and he said, no, 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 use mine. So yes. that's obviously a- a- absolutely. It's an one important of, one. It's one of those things, you know, public Wi-Fi is one of those things that somebody can get in and start uh, putting things on onto the, the network, to the router and getting it out. Everybody's connected might end up with a virus on their, on their computer. So there's ways that people can get um, through the Wi-Fi into uh, into disrupting your life, mm. um, and so yeah, the the way that you connect, I call it the, the you know having gates at the front of your driveway, making sure that your gates are locked uh, because those gateways to the internet are, are, are certainly really ways, important. Yeah, really important. So the human element continues to come up as a really important factor in remaining safe with cyber and and your clients' diamonds. Uh, what do you need to do on, a, on the human side to make sure that your cyber security protocols are really robust? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is training your staff. Um, and yeah, that's what Charmaine said yeah, as well. Yeah. So there's a consistency out there, Absolutely. everyone. Train the staff. And how is that? You've, you've been in a lot of different practices now talking about this. What's the best way to train the staff? Because I know in a lot of different organisations, I've done the turn up and you do the sort of, sort of the click-through training and, and to be really transparent, I would take none of that information away and apply it. So yeah. what's best practice in managing the human element? Yeah, I think I think there's two parts of that. There's there's the headspace. Do I really want to learn this stuff? Is this a pain in the, is this a pain for me? Or is this something that I actually care about? Uh, and when you've heard some of the horror stories, you do, you do start caring. And most staff in, in, in these small practices have never been subjected to this training. You've obviously worked in large organizations before where there was there was every organization that's larger around financial services provides vulnerability testing. You've all done phishing, you know, the phishing mm. training that comes in, the ongoing testing. Every three months. Yes. Yeah, exactly right. And and so you, and you do, do a lot of clicking in those three months. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And you've done you you've clicked I've on the wrong the thing. I've ticked the box and I've done nothing do differently. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so look, I think um I think the attitude is one thing, c- caring about the fact that this is your client's diamond. So there's a there's a big headspace in that, understanding that when you do multi-factor then you go, yes, it slows you down. It's a pain, but what is it? It's actually like a, a speed sign on a dangerous corner. It's going to slow you down for a really, really good reason that you don't drive off the cliff. You know, it's, it's, it's like understanding why you're doing it and appreciating the fact that you're doing it. And, 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 as and the said, time that it will save you afterwards because it's earlier. not if, it's when. Yes, exactly right. So I think, uh, I think the big thing is around um, the, the way that uh, all staff in the business, because it's not just up to the, the owner of the business or, or the, you know, the advisors in the business, it's up to all staff in the business to be caring about what they, how they treat their client data. Well, thanks for... You know, not only hosting the podcast today, but also joining us for a chat and being on a panel. This has been really fun, Fraser. Thanks for interviewing me, Danny. My pleasure. <laughs> Even though you don't really, didn't know much about the topic, you're like, ah, yeah. hey, no, this is what I'm here to learn. I'm going to learn. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.